Today on the show, Michael calls in to share how tax-deferred vehicles and capital gains harvesting allowed him to massively decrease his tax rate. Ben calls in to share how CLEP testing can be used both for civilians and for the military to massively advance your college position. And we welcome my co-host Brad back from what has to be the longest vacation of his adult life. Welcome to the Ultimate Crowdsource Personal Finance Show. This is your Friday Roundup. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Hey guys, I'm really excited to hop into this episode for multiple reasons. One, we're going to get a chance to talk about this past week's episode, talking about this vegan approach to financial independence. A lot of parallel overlap there. Parallel overlap. That might be a little bit duplicative, <laughs> uh, but we're going to roll with it. And then also I get a chance to welcome back my co-host, Brad, who has been gone for almost a month, climbing mountains all around Europe. Welcome back, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Good to be back in the U.S., like you said, we got back from nearly a month, month long trip to the UK. We spent a lot of time in London and then touring around Scotland. Yeah, it was really wonderful. It was this first time that I got truly to take advantage of this Phi lifestyle. And I think that was what was so neat about it. That's awesome. So walk us through your travels just a little bit here, because I know you spent you went to England first, right? Yeah. So we went to London and we spent uh, the first roughly eight or so days of our vacation there. And actually, Laura's sister, Jenny, and her family just moved to London about a year ago and they just had a baby. So we got to meet the little guy and it was really just a nice, relaxing vacation. That's kind of the cool part about, again, the five lifestyle you don't have to get everything in on a vacation in five days and cram every little sightseeing tour and have to fill up 16 waking hours a day. No, when you have a 25 day vacation, you can chill out, you can relax, you can see the sights and just have a day where you don't do anything, right? And you don't have to feel badly about it because that's kind of the point. Just relax, visit, and enjoy yourself. So I thought that was kind of a cool little rethink. And I wasn't anticipating that quite as much as it is it ultimately boiled down to. It was just a relaxing vacation. I think when you and I talked offline, you said, man, so many people say when they come back from vacation, oh, I need another vacation. And that was the polar opposite of where we were. Yeah. You know, actually, it strikes me that probably 30 or 40 episodes, we did one called Slow Travel. And I think up to this point, I've actually never experienced slow travel in my own life. I'm always thinking about the deadline in the back of my mind is the realization that I have to get back, that there is a almost never ending to do list following me from my you know W2 corporate job. And I'm wondering, have you experienced a vacation that lasts as long as this one actually did for yourself? Is this really your first exploration into this idea of slow travel, a month long vacation? I mean, in this one trip, You took off more days than I had for my employer for the past several years to cover both my sick time and my vacation time. All of that encompassed was less than this last vacation you took. Yeah, this is clearly like my first real slow travel as an official adult, if you will. I mean, after I graduated college, I went backpacking around Europe, but that kind of almost in my mind's eye, like doesn't really count. I hadn't started work yet. It wasn't like I had a wife or kids or anything, or just like real life to go back to. So I'm kind of putting that to the side. So this is the first time in my adult life that I've taken more than maybe 10 days off in a row. And I think that's what I always looked at. And I think that was one of those epiphany moments for me with the adult lifestyle, with working full time in that W2 job was back when I was 22, 23 saying, wow, you mean I'm so used to having these summers for my entire life, right? Every year in school, you get three months off. But now that I'm in the quote, real world, I will be lucky to take more than 10 calendar days off in a row until I'm 67. That always seemed like this crazy, almost like 
prison sentence. And clearly, I don't want to inject too much hyperbole into this, but that's what it felt like. And I, I think that was one of those moments where I said, this can't be the path for my life. It just, it cannot be the next 45 years of my life. So it's really neat, not let's say 17 years later, to be at a point where I control the course of my life. That's just such a position of power. And I think now this big, long vacation in August, every single year, I think this is gonna be a mainstay of our family. It was such a success. And now Laura and I are trying to brainstorm, where are we going next year? And I think we had initially anticipated we would go to South America to visit my brother and his fiance, but it seems like that may not work out. So we're actually contemplating going to Maui in Hawaii next year. So just kind of rent an apartment or an Airbnb for three or four weeks and just kind of live in Hawaii for, for a month. I mean, how amazing is that, Jonathan? Oh, it's so cool, dude. And one nice thing about it is that in particular with this podcast, I think both of us have had the realization that we can do what we did this time around, which is do an incredible amount of work so that you just don't have to think about it. And that's great. Or in theory, in reality, that's kind of a limiting belief that we can only record from Richmond, Virginia. All we basically need is Wi-Fi and a little bit of preparation. We could potentially do this from anywhere. And so my relatives who live in Zimbabwe have been begging us to bring their daughter back home for an extended period of time. And we now are faced with the reality that we can do this as long as we have internet. So I'm kind of looking at my calendar. There was this concept that we discussed probably back in the episode 50 with Vincent Puglisi, Freelance of Freedom. He introduced me to this idea of the Red X month, being able to look at the calendar and say, I want to put a Red X through this entire month to work on and do what I want to do to spend time with the people that bring the most value to my life, my family. And I want the autonomy to make that choice that has had so much appeal for me. And I have been designing a future, right, that I'm living into now that will allow me to pull that off. And this idea of autonomy, mastery, purpose, Brad, has really been something that has resonated with me over the last couple of weeks. And it's given me a better way of explaining why I'm so fascinated by financial independence. And I would say putting the emphasis on the FI as opposed to the early retirement. I was explaining it to an individual the other day. Why should you do this? And I said, you know, ultimately the pursuit of financial independence long before you even reach that, it gives you so much power to make choices that are in your best interest. When I reach financial independence, this is not about me going and sitting on the couch and doing nothing. I mean, I think frankly, if you tried to force me to do that, I would be trying to break out of the jacket that you have me in. I am passionate about doing something that brings value to my life in this case, and it's Choose FI. But what Choose FI has provided me and what I think a lot of us are actually striving for is autonomy, mastery, purpose. We want to work on the things that, you know, we want to work on the projects that we want to work on at the time that we want to work on it. If there's this tiny little problem that maybe seems like silly to somebody else. We want the freedom and flexibility to spend an entire day, maybe even an entire week, just trying to figure it out and sort it. And then I want purpose. I want to have impact. If you can hit all three of those metrics, regardless of what your bank account says, you're going to hit contentment, right? You're going to hit enough and you're going to find yourself in a very, very good place. And I found that by pursuing financial independence, I have now hit those three metrics. It's, it's incredibly appealing to me. Yeah, that concept first introduced to us here on the episode with Don Wetrick with autonomy, mastery, and purpose. I think that really hits home for me. That's a way to explain FI to people. And it's neat to see you having some success with that. And also us being able to record from wherever. The neat thing is you guys could come to Hawaii with us. Why couldn't you do that? Why it's, could we? It, it would actually be yeah. easier. <laughs> right? How awesome would that be if we actually, that would be hilarious. I'm not sure that most people understand that we're not even recording in the same room now. I'm at my house, you're at your house 25 minutes away. But the hilarious thing would be if we were both in Hawaii is that we could record in person. How funny would that be if it took flying 5,000 miles away to make that happen? <laughs> yeah, we actually have to leave the continental United States in order to find time to actually record together. I remember when we first started for probably the first like couple of weeks, maybe even the first month or so, you would come to my house to record. And we realized as this was kind of picking up some steam that you had just inherited a new commute. All this time that we had spent figuring out how to, you know, build lives that allow us to work from home and work on these projects, you had just built into your day another commute. And I think we had the epiphany while we were interviewing Jeremy from Go Curry Cracker. He is on Skype with us from Thailand. 
obviously not commuting from Thailand to be on this call and you're commuting from short pump to come here so that you can be on the conversation. We're like, huh, we probably need to rethink this. And immediately we were able to make a change. Yeah. I mean, that helped a great deal because like you said, it's not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things that, oh, I have this little commute, but if you can come up with an optimization, and I think that's what we've been trying to talk about here on the podcast for 150 plus episodes is if you can come up with some little thing, right? That aggregation of marginal gains, just try to find these pain points in your life and come up with a workaround. In this case, hey, let's test it out. It might've been terrible. It might've changed our dynamic that we were doing it over Skype or the quality might not have been as good, but why not test? And we tested it and it worked out great. It's a whole lot simpler for me to walk up the stairs and record than to drive to your house. So that was kind of a neat thing. And uh, yeah, just to go back real quick to my trip, I wanted to talk about some meetups that we had. So the second night that I was there, Barney from The Escape Artist and Ken from The Humble Penny, they are the, I guess, admins of the Chooseify local group there in London. And they put together this amazing meetup at this bar called The Anchor. And it's right there on the Thames River. I think we had what Barney estimated at 100 people showing up for this amazing meetup. Wow. And yeah, it was, Jonathan, it was so much fun. You know, it's incredible that Phi really has gone global. There are communities all around the world now. And if you want to find a a community of like-minded individuals, frankly, on another continent, that can now happen very easily using the local groups. And there are meetups everywhere. They're happening daily. And we're actually working, and Brad, I know you know about this as well, but to our audience, we're working on a way to start to bring in some of the photos from those meetups all around the world and share them on the chooseify.com website. Uh, Just really to hopefully bring this community together and increase awareness on helping people find basically a local community of like-minded individuals. Yeah. And what was neat about this particular one was that Barney told me that he remembers in the not too distant past that they had four or five people at a meetup. That was when it was like financial independence, London or some such. And there was nothing there. It was sure it was, you know, it was a good time to hang out with a couple of people, but, but now they had 100. That just shows how we say the the fire is spreading and it's spreading everywhere. It was really neat to see that personally and just to have all these people like it wasn't about me. I mean, sure, I guess some people were there just to say hello, but realistically, everyone was conversing with everyone. It wasn't relevant that Brad from Choose of I was there. That was besides the point. It was just this amazing get together. And I suspect at the next one, they're going to have 100. That is just so incredibly cool. And yeah, I just got to meet a lot of people. I think I was there, Jonathan, for five and a half hours. And did you lose your voice? I didn't. No, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. <laughs> You're getting better. You're growing into I'm, the world. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> but <laughs> we're going to get a special product made called Brad's Throat. <laughs> hey, I'll take it. I will take it. But yeah, it was neat just to to get to meet a lot of people that I had emailed with over the last couple of years. And, you know, too many to certainly mention names because I don't want to leave anybody out. But I got to meet Araminta, who was previously wrote our show notes, which was really cool. I, I know when I told you that you were surprised she was there and she wound up then organizing one in Edinburgh, Scotland for the next week because she knew that I was going up there. So yeah, our trip continued on to Scotland and then we toured around Scotland for about two weeks, but it was neat just to have this kind of impromptu little get together in Edinburgh. So, so Edinburgh, that's where Brandon, mad scientist is. Did he come to that meetup as well? He definitely did. Yeah. Him and his wife, Jill were there and and yeah, I got to hang out with the two of them for a couple of days and it was just, it was just a really nice time. So yeah, good trip for sure. And yeah, we just did a lot of like fun little things, like you said, kind of climbing mountains and hiking all over the place. And uh, yeah, just a really good time. You guys were uh, warming up to tackle Mount Fuji next year. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I said that on a, on the fire drill podcast, right? Yeah, they released that interview last week. They actually recorded it at Podcast Movement uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We were able to meet with them and record it live. And they got a bunch of questions from their audience, and which has a lot of overlap with our audience. And they did not let us know anything that they were going to ask ahead of time. So 
I love how you just threw me under the bus and would have me answer everything first. That way you had more time to think about a better answer. But Brad, you had a brilliant wow. interview. It was absolutely <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I think you think that I purposely threw you under the bus there. I just let Jonathan talk and it gives me space to think. <laughs> because he I didn't mean it endlessly. nearly as meanly as it came across. <laughs> I mean, that's the beauty of our partnership, right? Is that we have different skill sets. And I think that's what makes this podcast interesting. I get to kind of sit back. Like if you were gauging the number of words said, you're over 50%. I don't know what the number is, but I don't really care. We each get to use our own talents. And I think that's really powerful. I like sitting back and thinking and asking questions. That's where I get enjoyment out of this podcast in general. And, and I hope I add some value. So please, I know you, I, you took some offense to that, but I didn't mean it. <laughs> All right. I will, I will let it go. <laughs> you know, and speaking of being offended, Brad, talk about nailing a percentage of our population. We have a ton of runners in our group. And I think a bunch of them actually listen to our show while they're having their morning or daily run. And you threw all of them under the bus within the last episode or two. And a large percentage of them hopped on Facebook to let us know, not cool, dude, not cool. <laughs> yeah, that was very funny. I certainly didn't anticipate the reaction. And of course, hopefully everybody knows that I'm not ever going to alienate or make fun of a significant portion of the community just for no reason, just intellectually. I think that that's probably the, the first place to start. But I hope that everybody knew what I meant, that I wasn't talking about people who are lifelong runners and get that runner's high and, and just enjoy that time. I was kind of talking about the people who go to the 24 hour Globo gyms and are just slaving away on the treadmill because they think that's the best exercise for them. It just always strikes me as something that's sad to see those people literally day after day, week after week, year after year. And they're not really getting results from what I can see visibly. And obviously that that's a broad brush. It just is sad to me that people feel, it's almost like a penance. Oh, I had a bagel. I've got to suffer yeah. for the next three hours on the treadmill. Right? Like I've got to go run it off. That just mentally, that's never going to be a winning strategy for life. And talk about strategies. That is what we're doing here at Choose a Five. We're trying to come up with ways to save time, to save money, to be more effective. And to me, going up to the gym and running on the treadmill for an hour, even though you loathe every minute of it, and then not getting results, that should be one of those aha moments that like, hey, something's wrong here. Clearly, those were the people that I was talking to, not again, the lifelong runners who just enjoy it and get value out of it and, and find that to be one of the best hours of their day. So I think it was an important message. And, and of course, we're not always going to talk about the little, the little grievances that, uh, that come up on Facebook on the podcast, but, but this was an important one because it really does speak to that larger message of, Hey, if you're doing something that's supposed to be good for you, but you aren't getting results, then it's time to go back to the drawing board and figure something else out. I would say, and this is not like me drinking the CrossFit Kool-Aid or something insane like that. I don't really care about CrossFit all that much. I, I like the exercise. It makes me feel good. I'm getting good results, but I don't go to bat for CrossFit. It's, it's not my thing, but somebody would be better off doing 20 burpees a day. That would take under a minute than going to the gym for an hour and just killing themselves on that treadmill there would be more value there. And that's going to save you probably between the round trip to the gym, that's going to save you 90 minutes of your day. So what's the better strategy? I think clearly in that scenario, the burpees thing, and then you work up add an extra one a day. Okay. So eventually you get up to a hundred burpees a day. Like you're going to be ripped. You're going to be in incredible shape. That's still only going to take you under 10 minutes. So I'm just kind of spitballing thinking out loud, but that's the kind of strategy that I want our audience to really think about it. Look for those points in your life where you can do something better, where you can do something more efficient. So yeah, that's kind of my two cents. And Brad, I think it speaks to like the larger point of Pareto's principle, 80-20 in life optimization. And, and I do run. This is not a situation where I, you know, I think probably in that last episode, I said, I hate running. That is still true. I loathe running. That's my own nature. But I'll be darned. I do run. I still do it. We get up every single day and we start our day with it. And it's part of us living a more active lifestyle, but I don't just stop there. I don't think that that moves the needle. That's part of me just trying to have a more active lifestyle. And then I put my body under duress through weight bearing exercise and using the system that we talked about in that episode. I use specifically strong lifts. Now I am consistently trying to 
lift either more weight or more reps and slowly moving those numbers up week after week. And after I've been doing this now for like five or six weeks, it's incredible. You actually feel like your body come out of sleep and suddenly have a faster metabolism, suddenly have the ability to actually, you know, burn all the calories that you've been putting in your body up to this period of time. And it's that afterburn effect that's so incredible for me. So when I run, you get the benefits while you're actually running, but kind of when you're done running, that's just it. Whereas with the weight bearing exercise that I have started to embrace more and more, you actually feel your metabolism is elevated for hours and hours afterwards. And that's what I find so remarkable about it. But I think even weight bearing exercise only works in the context of a healthy lifestyle. You got to have this good foundation. And so it's not enough for me just to focus on, you know, one thing to the sole exclusion of everything else. Rather, it has to be a part, a piece of a healthy lifestyle. I think that looking at your diet is a huge part of that, which leads us back to this past week's episode. And I'd love to start by returning the favor and throwing you under the bus and getting your feedback on this episode first. Boo. <laughs> I'd always rather, I'd always rather you start. There? <laughs> <laughs> Very impressive. I think I've set myself up for my entire life now on this podcast of Sand having bag. to go first, but, but no, in all honesty, this was an eye opener for me. It really was. And, and I'm curious, I can't wait for my wife, Laura to listen to this because as I mentioned on the podcast, she's the one who, who does all the cooking in our house. So I certainly need her buy-in, but I think I want to do a test on this. Like James and Steven said, try this out for a handful of days, maybe a week, and just see how you feel. You just never know what kind of baseline changes that when you habituate yourself to like your normal American diet, and then you change it dramatically, you might not even know that you have health issues or that your baseline isn't perfect. And by changing something up, there might be positive changes that we can't even anticipate. Aside from the fact that, as these guys said, this is incredibly inexpensive. That was a big eye opener for me, Jonathan. I don't know about you, but that was a big takeaway. Just how little it costs to live this plant-based lifestyle. Yeah, and lifestyle. I couldn't believe that of the two of them, James, the bodybuilder, actually had a lower expenses. Even though I know Stephen has kids, and you've got you know an increased number of individuals, the fact that a a body a bodybuilder's diet is usually insanely expensive because of all the protein that they are shoveling down. Typically, that's the stereotype. And for him to say that between him and his wife, they were spending right around forty to fifty dollars a week. And that includes food for their dog. I was like, I have to see this written down. And so I'm reaching out to him to basically ask him, can you actually track this and show me on a one to two week basis what you're actually purchasing? That that is that is crazy. And, you know, I've met James in person. He has an incredible physique. He's clearly putting the work in. But to be able to maintain that level of muscle on essentially what comes down to 70 bucks a month per person how could that even be possible? And yeah, not only that, but his powerlifting numbers actually went up, even though he lost 18 pounds of body weight. That to me was absolutely remarkable. And he said he recovers faster, looks better, and feels better. I mean, that's a combination that everyone can aspire to, right? So if somebody like that, who like you kind of jokingly said, a powerlifter from Alabama, if he can, and of course that's a caricature, and but if he can go to this and see such amazing results, then why can't we all be open-minded enough to try it, right? So I think that was a big takeaway. James said that his meals have grown significantly and he eats so much more now and he's much more satisfied. So this isn't deprivation at all. That sounds like a really enjoyable thing. And as Steven said, he doesn't have these spikes in energy like he used to. And I think that's what a lot of people eating a standard Western diet where it's these carbohydrate spikes and crashes, that's not really a great way to go through life. And he's now moderating his energy by eating nutritious food at every meal and at snacks. Also, it sounds like how I was kind of joking about, hey, are you just going to the fridge and grabbing a bag of carrots and just munching on it? That sounds awful. But the way these guys described it is it's all about the spices, right? So they're eating these mashups of stir fries and stews and soups that have these incredible spice levels and taste and flavor. And that is the polar opposite of deprivation. That's something that sounds really, truly enjoyable. So all these factors lead to me saying, hey, this is something I really want to try out. 
I want to talk about the overlap of deprivation and kind of what your perception is. And I think that my bias has always been these vegans are fooling themselves into thinking that they're happy, but they're clearly deprived. And, you know, I'm not going to buy into that. And, and, but I didn't really believe that because I could see, I knew people in my personal life that make very rational decisions everywhere else that had made this choice. And I'm like, how could that possibly be sustainable? Because if I were going to go try and make a vegetarian meal, a lot of my flavor comes from the meat. Then it's just kind of a salad, the stale salad next to it. And that's obviously an oversimplification, but it carries that this was like my bias. But after that episode, and we recorded that, you know, several, several weeks ago, after that episode, I went ahead and I started making vegan pad thai. I've made it four times, four times since in the interim, since we talked, it's amazing. And I think I thought of tofu as this, you know, tofu being the flavorful element by itself. And if you try tofu, you will not be impressed all by itself is how you prepare it. It is a flavor delivery device, much like the uh, the French fry for uh, many other people. You know, it's a ketchup delivery system. But in this case, tofu in the context of this vegan pad thai is incredible. And I made this kind of marinade that you stew it in that involves dates and I think it's miso sauce. I'm, you know, these, all these terms are very new for me, but I have the recipe. I'll link to it in the show notes. I've made it four times. It's unbelievably flavorful and I've made some other changes as well. Now I am not fully on the vegan bandwagon, but I've been slowly moving and adopting my habits to get closer to where if I wanted to try it, it wouldn't be as dramatic of a pivot as it would have been even a month or two ago. And so there's a couple other things that I make in bulk now, and I'm just going to mention one of them refried beans. I've been trying for a long time to massively increase the amount of beans in my diet, the amount of fiber in my diet. When you look at one of the places that I have lacked over time, it, I don't include a ton of soluble fiber. And you know, in a world where everything seems to be bad for you, well, you have to put something back in. And I have decided to really try and increase my legume consumption. So as they were talking about beans and lentils. Now, I'm going to go and say, for the record, I'm not fully on board with the vegan thing yet. And so this refried beans does actually have some bacon in it currently, but I'm able to make like, of course it does. Course it That's does. awesome. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm trying, man. I'm trying. You got to start somewhere first, massively increase the legumes and see if I can taper it out. But the big point is that I have this amazing recipe to make basically two pounds of refried beans using an Instapot. I can have it done in about an hour and all of that liquid sodium that you would get you know, if you were just to buy these in a can, it's totally gone. And then I can portion that out. So if you put that with some rice, suddenly I have beans and rice, but they're not just beans and rice. They're amazing. You actually look forward to it. And if I wanted to then go vegan or at least vegetarian, all I would need to do is just slowly ease out the bacon. And now I'm there as opposed to my entire meal being based around this meat platter. You know, everything is this meat platter. So for the person that just wants to become, you know, eat more vegetables, going back to that quote that I referenced earlier by Michael Pollan, and he says everything that he's learned about food and health can be summed up in seven words. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. That is where I'm, I'm at. And I think if I look back at my historical consumption of food, it's all been around the meat. And that's a missed opportunity there. If I were to kind of reconstruct that and build my ideal life, it would be mostly plants with almost like meat as a side. And then if you made the decision to go completely vegan or vegetarian or any of the spectrum that they listed out, it's not too big of a stretch to try that. But I think I've been a essentially a meat addict. I have assumed for the longest period of time that I start my meal around what is my meat source going to be. And then maybe, maybe I branch out and I add a side of vegetables to that. And a lot of times those vegetables were corn, right? Or something silly like that. So this has been a total reframe for me. And I'm kind of building my life back out from this base of what's my plant source going to be. And then maybe, maybe I add a meat topping to that. The refried beans being the perfect example. Yeah. So Jonathan, this is obviously a financial independence podcast and clearly James and Steven described how inexpensive this could be. But do you have any sense, like, have you done any back of the envelope math on how much money you think your family could save going from your current consumption to a plant-based consumption? You know, I think at the point that we're at now, you can make a budget work either way, just by kind of using the principles that we've talked about. I think the point would really just be to be intentional with your budget, regardless of whether or not you decided to be vegan, vegetarian, flexitarian, any of those. It's just simply to start tracking the numbers and decide how much energy you want to put into it. For instance, if you were to go beans and rice, I mean, you could drive your budget into the ground. That'd be fine, right? I mean, you could you could 
pay virtually nothing to have a beans and rice diet. I think that my current kind of idea of what I'm going to do is I am an intermittent faster, so I usually skip breakfast and I have a early lunch right around 11 or so. Jonathan, can you explain what intermittent fasting is and the benefits? Yeah, basically intermittent fasting is a glorified way of saying I skip breakfast and I eat an early dinner. We've gotten so used to having meals all around us at all times, we're almost perpetually snacking and we never actually get to the place where our body has an empty stomach. That actually over time can cause problems for us. And it actually, I believe it can cause weight gain. Uh, In my perfect world, I have a period of time where I actually get used to those hunger signals and that becomes normal for me. And then I just compress my eating inside that window. Whenever you eat food, it goes into your stomach. Your stomach is this giant churning mixing machine that breaks it down into its smallest molecules. And then that food now broken down into molecules gets taken up to the rest of the body and used for different purposes like energy, et cetera. At some point, the stomach is empty. Most of us never make it to that point. Long before we ever get to an empty stomach, we get these hunger cues from our brain and we immediately follow it up by snacking. And over time, I believe that causes problems. Those hunger cues start misfiring and we just start constantly feeling like we need to eat. Inevitably, we end up eating too much and we gain weight. Being okay having an empty stomach, even if it's for a short abbreviated period of time, gives you power. It gives you more control. Uh, It also, just by the nature of you having these kind of hard rules in place, I don't eat before this time and I don't eat after this time, inevitably over time, you're creating a pattern that will end up having you eat less calories. If you look at many people's snacking patterns, they do really well throughout the day. And then when they're decompressing late at night, maybe after eight or nine, that's when they break out the ice cream and the brownies while they're watching the Netflix on TV. And then they just eat endlessly. Their body has nothing to do with it. It can't do it. It's not going to use it for energy. And so it has no choice just to store it for later. And our efficient bodies end up storing it as fat. This problem is compounded month after month, year after year, and we end up being definitely overweight and probably on the path to obesity. By having these hard rules in place, you kind of have gotten rid of the problem of decision fatigue. You don't have to think about that because it's already outside your window. You're actually happy at the thought of being just marginally hungry on either side of that. And it just forces a pattern that leads to a better outcome. All right. So there's basically this window where you eat. What's the general timeline for you? I usually start at 11 and then I try not to eat later than six, but sometimes that'll go up to seven. So some people refer to that to as a, uh, a 16, eight. So there's 24 hours in the day. So you eat in between eight of them. And then for 16 hours, you know, a lot of that being while you sleep, you are not eating. Yeah, that's very cool. And in the past when I've done it, I've done a six hour window. So I guess 18 off, six on. And when you say it like that, it kind of sounds like deprivation, but it's it's really not. I mean, I'm eating a really hearty lunch and then a dinner in the five o'clock hour and I don't ever snack anyway. So there's no no issue for me there. Like I'm not someone who's ever going to eat at eight o'clock at night. Like it just would never cross my mind. So oh, like it would cross my mind many times. <laughs> I have to fight the urge. <laughs> yeah, I think you and I are a little little bit different there with the the cravings on food, right? But uh, yeah, it's it just boils down to like me not having breakfast, which is really not that big of a deal. I have a cup of coffee, I have a whole lot of water, and that gets me through till noon, and I'm good to go. So it's something that I've dabbled with. It's not something that I I do exclusively, but a lot of people in the health and fitness world are moving towards this this intermittent. And I should say, Red, that on this particular episode, although a lot of our commentary isn't directly targeted towards, you know, becoming a vegan or vegetarian, we had so much overwhelmingly positive feedback on this episode. A lot of people identifying very directly with what James and Steven said. A lot of resources, comments, links on the Facebook group. We'll link to a few of those threads in the show notes. We got this email from Alex and he said, I just wanted to thank you guys for tackling the vegan issue with this week's episode. I've been pursuing five for two to three years and have been plant-based for over five years. As James and Stephen mentioned in their stories, the switch to a plant-based vegan diet has ultimately turned out to be much more wholesale positive change in my life than just my diet. I have long seen a strong parallel between the way the vegan community and the Phi community, both bucking what everyone else does just because it's normal in favor of a lifestyle that many label extreme because they find that living this way brings them more health and happiness. And I was excited to see that get expressed on the podcast. The switch to a plant-based diet for me was a huge catalyst in developing more of a growth mindset, something that seems so foreign, undesirable, and burdensome before I made the switch has become something that I hold incredibly dear. 
so much that I actually credit the change with opening me up to the possibility of making many more wholesale improvements in my life, like the pursuit of financial independence. Now, I completely understand being a little wary of veganism. I was turned off by even that word for years because of the somewhat well-earned stereotype of who and what a vegan was for so long. But I can attest that this is changing right before our eyes. There is a rapidly growing and thriving movement, very similar to FI, of folks attempting to upend that stereotype and live as examples of what a vegan or a plant-based diet can bring into your life. As a quick example, here's a short trailer from a documentary set to come out later in 2018 called The Game Changers, which is all about elite athletes of all kinds who have switched to a plant-based diet and are thriving. I'm going to link to that in the show notes, guys. With this life optimization strategy, just like any other, I strongly encourage folks to not let the fear of the unknown keep them from taking the first step and trying it out. There are so many great role models and resources out there for folks who are interested in making the switch. I definitely think there are financial reasons to consider the switch, but just like with most things, FI, the benefits ultimately go deeper, far deeper than a higher net worth. More health and happiness is always the objective, and I can attest that switching to a plant-based diet has brought me both in spades. Alex, thank you for weighing in with that. I I love your feedback. Yeah, and Alex, I like how you related this to kind of these communities that are coming together around some type of life optimization. And I think that's how Jonathan and I have tried to view FI in general and certainly the direction of this podcast. If we were just talking about the nuts and bolts of money every single episode, twice a week, 104 episodes a year, it would get really, really boring. But we see this as the bedrock of a life optimization strategy, right? So you get your money set and then it gives you that space to go out and pursue all these other opportunities to make a better life. And that doesn't mean we're proselytizing here for veganism. Jonathan and I aren't pursuing this. We're just trying to explore and open other people's minds to just different options that are out there and what people are benefiting from. And when you described kind of what what I call as like a PR issue, when you heard that word veganism, you kind of recoiled. Another avenue I've seen that is meditation, right? Meditation has the worst PR issue ever, but there are people, high performing people all across the world who are meditating daily and saying that it's making their lives dramatically better. And if you can make your life dramatically better in 10 minutes a day, why wouldn't you try that? It just doesn't make sense to me. So I think it's because people picture this as some guru sitting there with incense, chanting some kind of bizarre thing while they're meditating. That's not the way it works. You're just lying and relaxing and following your breath for 10 minutes and you feel better afterwards, almost for the rest of the day. So to me, that's a huge success. And I see very distinct parallels between what you're describing with the PR issue, ultimately between veganism and meditation. But Brad, just because I am not a vegan does not mean that I'm not interested in pursuing this kind of challenge, putting myself in the place of selective discomfort, leaning into discomfort to hopefully produce a better outcome because people whose ideas and opinions I respect tell me there's something here worth exploring. Let's say you try it and it doesn't work for you. You can always go back, but you're never going to know what you're missing out on if you're not willing just to put yourself in a slightly uncomfortable place. So I have decided to tackle this challenge and I've been dabbling with recipes that I can feel very comfortable employing in my own life for a period of like a week or two. I think I'm probably just going to do a one week challenge for myself where it's going to be, I don't know, see vegan feels very like I might miss something. So I don't know if I'm going to slap that label on it, but I'm going to do a one plant-based week with no meat no eggs. So eggs and bacon, that'll be tough for me to cut that out. But if I get rid of that, more or less, there might be something that might slip in there, but I think I can do a plant-based diet for at least a week. And I have a couple tools that are going to make this easier. One, I mentioned the Instapot. I've been a fan of that for a long time. I'm slowly adapting that to plant-based meals. Steven has given me some recipes that I've talked about in the past, including a chili that I tried. I've got the vegan pad thai, and we purchased a spiralizer. I had seen this thing talked about forever. You're gonna laugh at me, but I'm telling you, dude, it is amazing. It makes eating vegetables so much easier. We have been spiralizing the heck out of everything that we could find in the vegetable aisle at Wegmans. I think I can do this. So between my spiralizer my blender and my Instapot, we are going to massively increase our vegetable load over the next one to two weeks, or maybe not specifically, I've got to get my wife to actually commit and buy in. So it might be one to two weeks in the one to two week future, but we're going to do this 
and I'll report back on what it costs from a consumption basis. I'll try to track that. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, that's very cool. And of course, you get to indulge in your gadget love with the spiralizer. I'm very impressed. All links for products mentioned will be listed in the show notes for today's episode. You can support your true sapphire by using that. Oh, <laughs> no, fun. but it is really cool. I'm, I'm serious. Uh, the Instapot, I have, I have I not been consistently talking about that and using that for the past year. You know, there are these gadgets that you pay and then they never end up coming off the shelf and they just sit there like you have to put it in storage. I can say definitively the Instapot is not one of those. And I suspect having used my spiralizer for four out of the five last days that I'm not going to regret this one either. <laughs> and I have to say, one of your gadgets has really transformed my life for the better. I bought those Bose headphones. I think, what are they? The Quiet Comfort 25s, the noise canceling headphones for airplanes. And that has really revolutionized everything about air travel for me. It's, it's like the best, I forget what it was, 150 bucks or thereabouts. It might even be cheaper now. That was the best $150 I've spent maybe ever. I used to really dislike flying and I would get off and I'd be in a haze for hours. My head just couldn't get back to equilibrium. But now with these noise canceling headphones, it has made it a real pleasure. And I can now sit there and actually listen to podcasts or watch a movie and actually hear what's going on. I don't know. My hearing is kind of screwed up. So this is really, really beneficial for me. So thank you very much. That was just in my mind since I flew to and from Europe recently. Nice. Absolutely. Awesome feedback. I love it. All right, well, let's go ahead and take a few minutes and crowdsource this, bring in ideas from our community. And I want to first start by playing a voicemail that I got from Ben, and he was calling in to discuss military CLEP testing. Hey, guys. My name is Ben. Ben, listening to your podcast for a couple months. This is August 2018, so I got some catching up to do. I've been on the path to fire for several years. I'm almost at the end, but I like the podcast. Great content. And I'm calling in because I just listened to episode 55R, Friday Roundup. A guy called in who was in the military, and he wanted to give you some information about FAFSA and GI Bill and stuff like that and how he fast-tracked through college. And on a couple episodes ago, you also mentioned CLEP tests as a great shortcut. So I, I did similar things to both those people. I wanted out of the military, and I needed a degree. So with CLEP tests and GI Bill and some other tax, I guess. I was able to graduate in about three years. And I tested out of almost my whole associate's degree with CLEP tests. They're free for military. I don't know if anyone's mentioned that before. But every Saturday for about eight months, I took two proctored exams until I had tested out of my associate's degree. So I think your audience would use this. I, I've tried to tell other people about them. No one takes me serious, but I think this community will. It is a serious way to cut time and money out of your education. Even if you're a civilian and you have to pay 300 bucks a test, that's six months of your life. So I hope this is useful to someone and keep the content coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for Ben for weighing in on that. And I love highlighting and talking about club testing. Frankly, it's something that we've known about and it's something that we've mentioned on the show, but I don't think that we have found an individual yet who has push that to the max. I'm actually still looking for the individual because I know that if you can do it, I mean, I know there are individuals that have been able to pull off basically testing out of an entire bachelor's degree. It's that powerful. And basically six months of work, six months of test, and you just, you walk away with a four year degree. It's truly, truly a hack. And in the context for many careers where the degree is just simply a check the box that you need for that next promotion, it seems financially silly not to consider it. Yeah, I agree. It's something that my eyes have been open to. I wasn't all that familiar with it before the podcast. So it's neat to just find these different things that exist and explore them. And you never know when it might be useful, like you said, for you and your own job or kids someday. So lots of different ways to be aware of something, even if it's not applicable to you today. This next voicemail that I want to play, we got from Michael, and he is sharing how he was able to massively drop his tax rate by taking advantage of tax-deferred vehicles. Hey, what's up there, guys? I've been listening for a couple of weeks now. I started on episode one because I'm a completionist. I'm at episode 25, so I still got a little bit to catch up. But I've come across a pretty big win for myself, and I think some people that are in a similar situation to myself might get something from this. So uh, my situation was 
I realized I have a bit too much money in my taxable accounts. And I wish that I was putting more in the 401k years and years ago. I put in a good amount, but left too much to be taxable because I figured I could be a stock market expert and uh, I'm not, neither is anybody. So I thought to myself that I, I need to start moving the money over. So I up my 401k, max it all the way out and I'm essentially pay myself from my taxable account, selling off my individual stocks. So doing this, I'm starting to realize that not this year, but next year, since I'm not in a high tax bracket, my salary is about $41,000. And I'm thinking ahead for next year with all the stock I'm selling off with uh, the tax gain harvesting, as you guys have talked about, that next year and for the next maybe two years after that, I could get my taxes down to the 0% bracket. And how I'm going to be doing that is $41,000 salary minus $24,000, which is the 401k and Roth IRA max. I'm just going to take, that'll be taken out of my income. And then the $12,000 standard deduction that was increased for this year. So that's going to put my salary down to about $5,000, which is under 9,700. So for the next couple of years, uh, my taxes are going to be zero. So like ideally, this wouldn't be great for everybody because if you're putting more on your 401k right away, then you wouldn't have too much in a taxable account. But for people who are in my situation, if you realize you have too much in a taxable account, you want to move it over, you could really work wonders with your taxes and lowering a tax bracket. So uh, yeah, yeah, just wanted to share that and get that out there. So Thanks for listening to the voicemail and you guys have a great day. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, this is incredible. This is absolutely multiple different tax hacks that we've talked about on the podcast throughout the 150 plus episodes and he put it together into his life. And that's what's so neat here. So he's saying that he's starting with his $41,000 income and he's reducing it by now he's able to max out the 401k which is, I think, $18,500 in 2018. While he might not get there this year, I think he was saying in the future. So let's even talk about 2019. He'll be able to max out that $18,500. And he did say Roth IRA, but I think he meant traditional IRA because that would be the one that gives you the deduction in the current year. So that would get him over $24,000 worth of deductions right there plus the $12,000 standard deduction, I guess he's single. So it gets him down to a taxable income of a tiny little amount, maybe $5,000, which I think the lowest tax rate is still 10%. So his federal tax would only be $500, which is amazing on a $41,000 income. And it enables him then to do this tax gain harvesting. When you're in that low tax bracket, you're actually able to sell off appreciated securities and pay $0 in tax on that capital gains. So he's able to, in essence, live off of this money. It's kind of just looking at this pot and he's actually selling these securities and living off of that. But really what's happening is he's able to take that money and put it into his 401k. It's it's just a bucket strategy. He's still living off of the same amount of money that he was previously, but by using these incredible, incredible tax strategies, he's able to lower his tax liability down to somewhere in the vicinity of $500 a year for federal liability and max out his 401k and do this capital gains harvesting. So, I mean, this is as big a win as you can come up with. Yeah, I get so excited hearing the success story. I mean, just visualize this. He's a completionist. He didn't want to start with the latest episode. So he went back to episode one. When he got to episode 17 and 18 and 18 R, 18 and 18 R specifically, the light bulb went off and he said, holy crap, I can do this and I can move my tax rate virtually down to zero. I'm in this unique position where I can take this theoretical strategy, apply it to my life and crush the game. It's just really neat. And I appreciate Michael, you're reaching out with this with this win. It's really awesome to see it actually put into practice. Well, unfortunately, guys, that is going to bring this episode to a close. Now, as you know, we like to finish every episode by doing a drawing for a copy of a book that we have found useful. 
And there's uh, three books that we offer. The first is J.L. Collins' book, The Simple Path to Wealth. The second is Dominic Cortuccio's book, Design Your Future. And the third book is Vincent Puglisi's book, Freelance to Freedom. If you want to enter the drawing, all you need to do is leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. To do that, just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes. Follow the written instructions there. Leave us the review. Send us an email to feedback at chooseify.com, letting us know that you left a review and what screen name you left it under. Every week on the Friday Roundup, we announce a winner. We give away one book for every five written reviews that we get, and we announce a winner on the Friday Roundup. Brad, how many winners do we have today? All right, Jonathan, we have one winner today, and the winner is Quinn. And Quinn said, this supercharged my FI motivation. I'm a saver and always have been. I have a high level of self-control when it comes to spending and saving, even though I don't do so well in the earning part. I've always loved learning about finance. Within the past two years, I've read Dave Ramsey, Taxes, personal finance, home buying for dummies, a few investing books, and I even started taking online classes for becoming a real estate agent just to understand the subject better. However, I was still thirsty for more and couldn't find what I was looking for until Choose FI. Choose FI is the advanced table of contents to finance that I've been looking for. It's a great springboard into many financial chapters. On top of that, Choose FI has literally supercharged my motivations. I love hearing the cases of people who have made it, hearing their tips, and learning the tricks to retire early. It resets my mind to where it should be every week when I tune in. Chooseify has confirmed many of the things I've learned on my own and has challenged my viewpoints by showing me the other parts of the puzzle. I will definitely continue to listen in and recommend the podcast to my family and friends. I'm excited for my financial independence journey, and I know that Brad and Jonathan will help keep the fire burning. All right, my friends, if you got value from today's episode, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. It just lets the providers know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. The fire is spreading, my friends. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.